My name is John Piggott. I'm the director of a research centre in Australia called CEPA, and I'm professor of economics at the University of New South Wales from Sydney in Australia. Before we begin these proceedings, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands who are present here today. Since this is a virtual event and we are spread around the world, I encourage you to include the lands you are on, if you know it, in the chat function. I'm currently on Gadigal land. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this special pair of sessions um, for IPRA, the International Pension Research Association. The theme of this special session is financing retirement in the 2020s and beyond the global experience. The session is sponsored by IPRA, and IPRA is a new international organization established with the aim of improving the quality and impact of research and pension on pensions and related aging issues uh, to optimize social and economic outcomes in the world we inhabit, which is an <sighs> aging world. IPRA was jointly founded by the center that I direct, CPA, by Net Spa at Tilburg University and by the Pension Research Council at the Wharton School in the University of Pennsylvania with Willis Towers Watson and the OECD. Professor Hazel Bateman, uh, who will deliver the closing remarks later on, uh, is the inaugural president of IPRA. We have a range of membership options for individuals, organizations, those with research interests, and they are available on the website. So today's program features six paper presentations and it is truly global. We have presentations from Israel, India, Peru, Chile, and then two from the US. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to the chairperson of the first of two sessions. So the papers will be divided into two groups of three. Uh, so the chairperson for the first session is Pablo Antolin. Uh, Pablo is principal economist and head of the private pensions unit and deputy head of the OECD consumer finance insurance pension division. Uh, he, uh, and he received his PhD from the University of Oxford. So Pablo, uh, I turn the podium over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, Hazel. And thank you everybody for be being here at the end of the day. Uh, these kind of um, meetings are for all of us to, to share experiences and work. And in this session I'm chairing, I have three interesting papers uh, and three interesting researchers or authors of each of those papers. We have Maya Haren Rosen from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She will be the first one talking about. She will talk um, uh, ab about an issue that is quite important, the, the multiple accounts, the lost and forgotten retirement accounts. And it will be assessing two campaigns that has been implemented in, in Israel to raise awareness. And one of those campaigns uh, uses uh, a FinTech innovation. And I leave it there because uh, she is now going to explain it to us. What are those innovations and what are the results of those assessments? Uh, just one quick thing before I give you the floor, Maya. Just um, remember that um, you, will, you all have 20 minutes maximum and there will be five minutes for question and answer. And as John said, you can put, the audience can put the, the question uh, in the chat and the questions will be answered by the authors at the end of each of their presentations. Thank you, Maya, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the organizers for um, inviting me to speak. I'm going to present a paper about an active retirement account, as Pablo said. Um, this is a work co-written 
with Professor Orly Sadeh from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And I'm also both from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and from the Bank of Israel. I'm gonna start with some motivation. Why is this an interesting question, uh, a subject to look at? And then I'm gonna present uh, the investigations from three different data sets, data sets and conclude. So first, why is forgotten accounts or inactive retirement accounts an interesting thing? First of all, um, inactive accounts are accounts where um, payments are no longer coming in and they are just left there. And the problem with this is that it could, um, uh, these funds could be forgotten and lost. And then even though people are saving in them, at the end, when they reach retirement, they can't access these funds because they don't remember they exist. Um, additionally, if you have a lot of accounts, it's hard, it's difficult uh, to manage them all together. And this is uh, becoming a, a growing global concern as we move from a DB to a DC saving system where by each employer, he could open up a new fund for you. Um, you get uh, more and more accounts, especially as uh, it's becoming a more dynamic job market. People move around a lot more and these kind of small or inactive accounts are becoming more and more um, happening all over the world. Um, although these are usually small accounts, they can add up to significant economic loss losses over time. And it's, um, we're also interested, so I'm gonna present to you a FinTech consumer regulation investigation. Uh, it was aimed at lowering cost at this, uh, for consumers to this issue of an active retirement accounts. The FinTech uh, regulation was supposed to both lower observation cost as well as transaction cost to taking action regarding the, these inactive accounts. And what we wanted to investigate is even after this big campaign, uh, is there still an attention to the issue of an active retirement accounts? Do costs remain? And are some population more prone to having higher costs than other? Do they have higher limited attention? Um, so our case study is, it is an Israeli uh, financial regulation called Mountain of Money. It was supposed to be a buzzword. Um, it, it was a huge campaign uh, that was based on a, on a website that took information from all available retirement savings uh, providers and um, easily aggregated all the information to show, um, to show people where they have an active retirement account. Meaning this new website, people could enter it, put very simple information that everyone in Israel has from their ID uh, card, and then see where they have an active accounts and how to contact the managers of the accounts in order to close the accounts or transfer them or even just be aware of them. So that was the, for, the first part of it. And the second part was, um, it, additionally, there was a, a tax exemption on small and active accounts in um, Provident funds, which is one specific type of retirement savings. The, the tax ex exemption came into effect because new minimum fees were coming into effect, meaning that for small accounts in these type of uh, vehicles, they would be eroded over time. Uh, the minimum fees would be high or higher than the interest rate and the small accounts after a few couple of years, um, there would be no money left in these accounts. The government wanted to help people um, close these accounts and they offered the tax incentive to both withdraw it uh, just even take it as cash, uh, uh, but people could also choose to transfer them. So this is the two uh, campaigns. For the first is the website, the second is the minimum fees and tax incentive. And why is this an interesting study case? Case study first, it lowered uh, it lowered cost. It was both a huge nationally publicized campaign. It was the largest campaign that the Ministry of Finance in Israel had ever did, did up to that point, it's relevant for everyone. Um, because whenever you move a job or you have any part-time job, in Israel we have uh, a mandatory savings regime, meaning that um, almost every time you start a new job, a new retirement fund is open for you. And uh, unless you're, you transfer it and you make sure that everything is uh, Save together at one point, it could happen that you have multiple accounts, even I had, 
<laughs> so this is uh, really relevant to everyone. And it should not be affected by preferences that we know from take up um, literature. There is no negative information or myopia. So it's very clear what we expect for net rational individuals to do. First, everyone should enter their accounts and see if they're if they were at any time in the job market, they should enter that site and see if they have any inactive savings accounts that they were unaware of. And if they do have these small inactive retirement accounts in Provident funds, they should close them, either withdraw it or transfer them, because if they leave it there, they're giving the money away. That's why it's a pretty clean setting. And we want to see if there's still indications of inattention, uh, even following these campaigns and our populations that have higher, are there population that have higher limited attention? We specifically look at those with low financial literacy and low socioeconomic status. And at the end, we're also, I'm gonna present a field experiments to see if we to have some something to look forward to. Can we do better? Uh, we're gonna present a field experiment with personal touch. So the first uh, data source and investigation is from the Provident Fund data. Um, where it was a, one of the largest ones in Israel. We have 13, almost 13,000 eligible inactive accounts. These accounts were during the, the time period of the tax, tax exemption, right before the minimum fees came into effect. So all of these funds should have been closed during the investigated time period, because if they're left there, um, they should be eroded over time. Um, and although we, we know that it should all be closed. Only 16% of eligible accounts were closed. Um, this is also similar to what we know from the pension regulator about that time. Seems this is good data. And we know uh, account holders' gender, age, uh, if the account, uh, the number, the, the size of account, the locality of where the account holder lives, and if the account was closed during this period of the tax exemption. And what we see that, um, Although it was initially a relatively small, though the 16% is a high closing rate, rate um, much higher than the base rate, it is eligible. It's it's low if you if rational people should it all should be 100% closed. But there are also differences between where people are coming from. If we we look at the locality data, it's uh, we find that it's statistically different, uh, statistically meaningful that people coming from higher socioeconomic locality, localities have a much higher closing rate than those coming from low socioeconomic index localities. Also for people living in more peripheral places uh, have a smaller closing rate than those coming from more central localities. So this makes sense. Um, this would have been ex as expected, but um, it is um, meaningful and, and it's different and the differences are even larger when we look at account size. So then uh, we want to know, this is, we know what they did, but we want to understand um, why they did it. Uh, so we move from what they did to what they say they did using survey data. Um, what's good with surveys is we could get a little bit more information about people uh, about their choices, and we could design the questions, but we can't observe actual actions as we saw from the provident data. There's always the question of rep representativity and a survey process may be biased. Um, we used uh, a professional survey company uh, and we got a 504 re um, representative sample of the population, but this is an internet survey. And the most uh, the most interesting variables that we emphasized are two. The first is objective measure of general financial literacy. This is the three big uh, Lusardi and Mitchell questions that are used in the literature to see who has high uh, understanding on financial concepts. And the second thing is we, we asked about subjective co uh, concept of retirement knowledge. This is how much people feel they are comfortable and understand this issue. Um, we call this subjective financial literacy. It's a way how people feel they understand. And we look at both of these uh, variables from the survey data to try to see how this explains how people reacted to the campaigns. We see that objective financial literacy um, had a, a, a statistically significant fair effect on awareness. This is from logic regressions. Um, for dummy variables, um, the first two regressions are for being aware of the mountain of money 
campaign, and the second is the timely, timely tax exemption campaign. Both, uh, both have a statistically significant effect objective for objective financial literacy to being aware. But when we look at actions taken, either entering the website or contacting the fund uh, manager with intention to close an account, they're both the two right-handed um, regressions, we see that their subjective financial literacy, the subjective concept of knowledge is more statistically significant and has an effect, and objective financial literacy no longer is statistically significant, meaning it seems that you need the knowledge to be aware of these campaigns, but you need the concept and uh, of your own knowledge and having the confidence to take actions regarding these campaigns. And then so we know people who have, and this is also in line from what we know from Provident Fund data that those having low uh, financial literacy usually come from low socio socioeconomic status. So up till now, we know people from low socioeconomic status uh, seem to be less aware and take action. This seems to be stemming both from financial literacy uh, that affects awareness, but mostly from financial, uh, subjective financial uh, um, literacy and confidence in the issue. And can we mitigate the friction? So we, we did a controlled field experiment. We took in a population with very low subjective and objective financial literacy, as we saw from survey data. We have ultra-Orthodox Jews in Israel. It's a closed, relatively closed community in Israel, uh, kind of like the Amish <laughs> in a way. And we looked at the Money of Mountain 2 extended surveys for, uh, the, they use the same fintech baseline website that aggregates uh, data from all providers and uh, allows for easy access to information about an active account. But the money of Mountain 2 was on the banking system. It was on the, the uh, same website. And we used both digital and personal interaction interventions to see. So we first had a control group where they just answered survey data. The second got an email that explained about the Money Mountain 2, and then they got an email. The third got an email with a video explanation with a, a person telling them about the Money Mountain 2 campaign, um, the website, how you enter it, what you need to do, um, and what information it entails. And then they did following that a survey uh, to see how effective was this intervention. It was a frontal explanation where someone from the Bank of Israel, me, <laughs> entered, um, and gave them an explana explanation that is the similar to the video one about what is Mountain Money 2 and how you enter it and what you can find there. Following that was also a survey a week following that to see um, how the interact intervention worked. And to get just a little bit more uh, observations, we, we the first control group that got an email, they also had an additional uh, email being sent to them after the survey, and then they took another survey just to see if there are differences and just to get a little bit more observation because it was really small sample size. Um, just to say that we did this in an ultra-Orthodox uh, Jewish college for women who are studying either health profession or education. Mm -hmm. I see Pablo. Thanks. And we see that um, all the intervention had a positive effect on awareness, it seems, but mostly those with a personal touch, meaning either they saw a person face-to-face uh, -face or from the email, um, a video, uh, or uh, following the explanation. And it seems that these uh, personal touch also affect both awareness and also taking action following the campaign. So to sum it all back, um, we, saw, we looked at a, regular, a regulatory innovate, innovation aimed at lowering, co uh, um, lowering an attention to inactive retirement accounts. We still find an indication that there's limited attention and that this is higher, these costs are higher and limited attention is higher for those coming from low socioeconomic population with low objective and subjective financial literacy. It uh, seems that subjective financial literacy is more important for taking actions. And it seems that more can be done. Maybe regulators need to think about getting uh, to, more, to a more personal interaction, interaction, specifically with these populations that have low subjective financial literacy. This could also be done in digital media, 
with a video explanation with a person showing all the steps. And this could be mitigate the friction. And thank you. Thank you very much, Maya. Um, I think we are now on time to start with or to go ahead with the second presentation. Uh, the second person is Amlan Ghosh from the National Institute of Technology, Durjampur in India. He's going to talk about, in general, about coverage, but is going to focus on something we 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 have worked here at the OECD. We call it non-standard forms of work. Um, the paper talks about an organized uh, sector workers and looks at the micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises and to see um, what factors and what issues are important for them to to participate in saving for retirement. So I let Amlan welcome Amlan to. Yes. To explain to us the experience in India. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, accepting the work and uh, giving the opportunity to share the work here. Uh, the title of uh, the paper is just like as as uh, you, are, you are talking about this understanding the you know old age financial stress of those uh, the unorganized sector workers and also to understand how they actually behave for retirement planning. Uh, so that's that's what we try to understand in, through this paper. Uh, this is uh, this actually work from the India uh, Indian sector. Uh, so we, I have focused mainly in the MSME sector. Uh, so just to understand that, you know, uh, we know that the India is the second most populated country in the world, and uh, with maximum uh, young population at present, and uh, therefore it has a tremendous burden uh, to provide job as well as the old age security in the coming years, and therefore that becomes much more important for policymakers to understand these particular phenomena that was going to happen after 20 years or 30 years and these people are going to be you know uh, old is going to be uh, older from present situation therefore and at present if you look at the indian condition you'll find that around 30 million uh, you know central and state government employees which are actually uh, the government employees they are actually covered under uh, uh, defined benefit uh, program which are actually tax funded and if you think about uh, the the tax funding of that that the total cost of that every year which actually comes around six point uh, around 6.5 billion dollars every year that's what the india is, is, is financing right now but if you look at the you know structure of the indian uh, you know uh, the workers then you need to understand that you know in total india we have 450 million workers which are actually presently working and out of that, you could find that only 30 million is, is in the government sector. The rest all are in unorganized sector, right? So you can understand the majority, the 93% of the working population in India is actually employed in the unorganized sector. And that's more important because this 93% is absolutely unorganized sector. And, and, and you can understand it's almost, that is comes around 480.5 million workers which actually employed in the unorganized sector. And therefore it's important for the policymaker to understand what to do with this because they are not covered properly with the uh, pension. And if you look at how exactly the, the progress has been uh, in, the, in India, you'll find that you know for during the last uh, 20 years or so, because of, after when India took the economic reforms, uh, a lot of jobs in the formal sector are becoming informal in nature. So they, that actually becoming more informal. If you see the distribution, you'll find that you know the the Total unorganized sector, you know, work has actually from, see, you can understand the organized sector work which was total in 17% in 2010 and 12, it has come down to 13%. So you can understand, and even the unorganized sector total uh, percentage in the total work has increased from 83 to 86, uh, almost 87%. So for by 4% they increase. So the informalization of formal sector is going up, which means that you have a list of a formal job which is having a job contract or other, other benefits and all. So it, we are going towards more of an informalization of the formal sector. Now, uh, if you look at the present uh, social security scenario in India, well, you know, these all are basically targeted to the uh, tax funded uh, formal sector employees, those 30 million we're talking about, right? To all civil services schemes, the EPFO scheme, which is also a formal sector, uh, 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 scheme, then the others public enterprises. So all even some micro pension schemes are there where the unorganized sector can participate. But apart from all, are mostly uh, you know assistance, whatever is here is generally for the formal sector. 
Now, if you, now if you look at the unorganized sector thing, then we actually it was only a public provident fund where organized sector can they themselves have to uh, you know invest. It is a contributory kind of a thing uh, where nobody is going to contribute. Government is not going to contribute. Only you are going to uh, invest and you to uh, wait till it matures. And otherwise, there are certain other you know uh, small uh, regulated uh, bodies which are actually serving to them. For example, you know. Uh, Seva, for example, working a woman program in India, Masaji Workers Board, some other boards are there which actually provide a very selectively with few unorganized sector. And, uh, you know, uh, and also one uh, UTI is uh, this is a public sector unit which actually provides retirement benefit for the low income people. So, uh, it's actually in 2006. So, this was the system which was going on since 2006 and 2009 for unorganized sector, and therefore they did not have a proper way of you know uh, uh, actually investing in in in, in, in uh, old age security right now therefore you know policy makers also thinking about that you know uh, for this area and pension reforms are actually introduced in india right and in 2004 a new pension even those 30 million you know you actually the budgeted cost is very high and therefore government are also thinking about how to get rid of it because its expected is very high so this because it's a tax funded so therefore, they try to introduce, even in government sector, some contributory uh, uh, benefit pension system without, uh, I mean, uh, just to say so themselves from defined benefit to contribution system. End of uh, March 21, there were 7.3 million people were from the government sector were in the NPS. But later on, this NPS system was actually introduced to the unorganized sector. That, okay, fine, why don't you bring the unorganized sector into it? And, uh, and in, so from 2010 onward, it was introduced uh, one system, a pension scheme called NPS Lite. And later on, it was renamed and then guaranteed pension scheme was introduced from, in, from 2015 uh, to the unorganized sector. Now, even if it was actually given uh, to the unorganized sector, it was introduced. Uh, but you know, if you see the development of that you know, in our organized sector, because we have more than 418 million uh, unorganized sector people, but the development is not so far. If you see, look at the total development, it's only 32 million is actually by the end of March is covered, right? So only 32 million has actually covered by this bar. But there is a huge gap between the actual number of uh, unorganized sector people are working and the people are actually covered out of it, right? But along with that, in 2009, in very recently, there are two other schemes are also introduced. One is, uh, you know, PMSYM where you could find that you know within a very short span of time 4.4 million people are actually uh, you know registered there but even if you look at the total number it's only around 36.7 million right so if you think about the total coverage government sector has 30 million and uh, and and the the unorganized sector at 36 million the total is only 66 uh, million people so you can understand that you know uh, total coverage in india is only 14.83%. So we can understand that absolute, almost more than 85% people working population is out of any kind of, you know, you know uh, any kind of pension coverage. And therefore, we, because most of that 93% are unorganized sector, we are focusing on more of an unorganized sector. And uh, as we already said that if you look at the unorganized sector, you know, only 8%, 8.7, 7 8% are covered. So rest all are uh, not covered around so not more than 91%. So for them, it's important for the government to have certain kind of policy. That's why this work is important to understand how exactly this, this is going on. And even if you look at the India's demographic transition, which is, uh, you know, uh, the projected population, uh, what we expect, that India is going to have one, almost 1.6 billion uh, people by the end of 2050. So it, it's going to be a, a very tough for the uh, you know, government to, to, uh, to check those uh, uh, things because they have to want, they have to provide jobs as well as they have to provide old age security. Therefore, it's become very important for the government to look this particular matter very seriously. And that's what it should be. And if you look at the uh, you know, uh, life expectancy uh, uh, you know, at birth, it is also going to increase, right? By 2050, the life expectancy, which is right now 69.9, .9, is going to be 75%. So people are going to stay more, and therefore they need a more of a pension coverage because in old age they require uh, more of a pension uh, scheme because for longevity risk they will increase. And if you think about the life expectancy at the elderly, even at the 60 years, it's going from 18.34, it is going to increase to 20. 
uh, years uh, in 2050. Even at the 70 years is going to increase from 11.77 to 12.98, so almost 13. So all are increasing. So therefore we need a more of a pension coverage than what still we have. And the, otherwise there will be a mismatch and there will be a clamor in the society. That's very imp important to address at this particular juncture. And if you look at the you know, pro proportion of the population above 65 of years, that's presently at you know, 90 million, million presently. It's going to be more than you know, 225 million, what is expected in projected population report uh, by 2050. It is once again, you can see it's an alarming situation what the government have to face. Uh, otherwise, you know, have to look after the longevity risks with the better healthcare system and uh, you know people are living more so therefore you need to provide a more of a pension system otherwise uh, there would be a, a societal problem and said we need to provide them otherwise they will be facing a tough situation in their older age even uh, not only that the dependency ratio uh, if you think that that is going to be also going to increase from 2020 which is 9.8 it's going to be at 20.3 by 2000 uh, 2050 so, so all are increasing, therefore we need to look after this particular uh, issue. So our objective in this case is, is actually, you know, to understand the financial decision-making behavior of the unorganized sector. We have specifically focused on micro and small uh, medium enterprises, uh, worker in the retirement planning. Uh, and why we have selected the MSME here? Because if you look at the, their gross value added contribute our MSME in India and the GDP, because they have substantially amount their contribution there in the economy. And, and, and look at that, uh, the, the, the cost value added shared in a MSME and GVA is more than 33%. So therefore, uh, even the GDP is more than 30%. So they have a huge uh, you know, role to play in MSME sector. And most importantly, if you look at the number of jobs there, right? So if you look at the number of MSME in India, which is very important, we have 63 million uh, MSMEs are there and out of that micro, uh, which is where the less than 10 people are working, which is having almost 99% are in the uh, micro sector, uh, uh, micro MSMEs. And if you look at the employment there in all MSMEs, you'll understand 110 million people are actually working there in MSME sector in India. And, and out of that, almost 97% are in the micro, uh, uh, you know, uh, micro uh, MSMEs. And uh, mostly, if you think about rural, they, they, you can understand the 45% rural people are working in those MSMEs. So therefore, it's very important, uh, uh, this particular sector to look after at first when your policymakers are there. The first thing that you can actually go and understand this sector very well, because a lot more you know, data and document you have to address this particular sector. Now, uh, we have done uh, you know, uh, this particular study uh, uh, through a primary survey. Right, uh, and uh, this particular survey was sponsored by the Government of India's fund. And uh, the maximum, uh, we have done it in West Bengal because precisely because uh, the West Bengal has the highest number of MSME in uh, the state uh, in, in India. And uh, this whole MSME is uh, broadly ca categorized into 17 sectors. And we know those uh, from, the, uh, from the government that, we, that the total population or the total workers working in that uh, West Bengal is almost 5.72 million. Uh, unorganized sector workers are there. So we, we have, uh, and, and, and they are actually distributed among uh, you know, 278 different groups in West Bengal. And, and based on this, since we know the population, so we actually uh, you know, collected our survey through multi, uh, the multi-stage sampling procedure. And we actually calculated the sample uh, size to be 100, uh, 1,067. And, and then we actually allocated proportional allocation and then we got these different you know, uh, sample from different districts of the uh, West Bengal. And ultimately we collected the sample uh, from different districts uh, to our MSME's uh, recorded data and to the, those uh, you know, MSME sector workers. And if you think about our uh, sample, uh, you know, uh, if you think about in gender uh, uh, distribution, uh, almost 87% are male and 12% are female in this case, and uh, uh, some, uh, I mean, if you think about the uh, other responses, some are married, I mean, mostly are married in that case. So that's the distribution of that. And if you think about different age groups, you know, most of the workers are in the age group, if you think about 32 to 32% are in 36 years to 45 years. So mostly young workers in India are there, right? And the uh, income group, if you think, then most of the average, if you think about the, even the median, they actually earn around 10,000 to 15,000 
uh, Indian rupees, which comes around, uh, you know, if you look at uh, in, in, in Indian uh, currency, it will be around uh, at 150, uh, 60 dollars, not more than that every month, right? So they earn this much of money. So, and if you think about the level of education of those people, uh, you know, mostly our school level, you know, if you think about the up to class 10 level standard, up to class eight, so it, it almost 60 and 25, so almost 87 percent are, uh, uh, you know, are having a school level education, not more than that, class 10 standard education, right? And if you to know more about there, because this level, to more about the, the financial stress, what they have, and awareness level. So what we have done that uh, we try to understand, uh, you know, uh, to know about their knowledge of the old age retirement savings product, what they're thinking about that, their income level, uh, their expenses, their financial obligation on dependents, and their accessibility to financial services, and other ways and means in financial uh, habits. So we try to understand this. And what we found that, you know, the number of dependents are, are uh, I mean, generally, I mean, if you see the 43% here and 53, so almost this 90% having around dependency of, uh, you know, dependents they have around three to six, right? So number of dependents they have. And if they, these people, when they try to save, they, you know, you will find when the dependents are very high, then they try to save more, right? So because they have a dependency, so they have to save more uh, for them uh, because they have a dependency. So therefore, to run the family, they have to spend uh, more. We will go to the technicalities later. And if you think about the average, uh, you know, income group, you will find, uh, you know, you know uh, what how, how they save actually. You'll find if the higher income people save a little higher. Now the the lowest, uh, I mean, who are the lowest, they they actually save around, you know, uh, around thirty three dollar a month. And the highest people, they actually save forty five dollar approximately a month, right? So they do not save much because of, I mean. As we already said, they have a dependency and other uh, expenses to bear, but they save. The next question we try to understand why, I mean, uh, the why they save and how, I mean, where they save and uh, why they save actually first and how they save. So we'll find that because of the child education, 44%, 44, 45% people are saving because of the child education and rest 44% are actually, you know, they're, they're saving because of, uh, you know, they need more of a domestic reason. Uh, uh, not only education, but to run the family and other things. And 21%, they say they, they, they save for, uh, they, they, they actually save for the healthcare. And then almost 20% for uh, in the child marriages. And 14%, what we found is they, they were thinking about the old age uh, security. They, they First, they talked about the old age security. Then we thought about if they're talking about old age security, let's find out how they save. And when you try to understand uh, about their financial, uh, you know, how they save and how what they do, First, we try to understand whether they have any access to financial services or not. We found that uh, you know 94 percent have their bank accounts with them, and it is what we found that this is the impact of the the new policy what the government has taken as a Jandhan Yojana in 2015. So we find that you know for the investment purpose uh, for long term only they have invested for the old 0.76 percent, right? So uh, only very very short period of uh, amount they save. And therefore, we try to understand how uh, awareness uh, these people are having aware about the oldest security. So their awareness is 56%. Then we try to understand their financial literacy. So uh, research has already established that you know probability uh, of retirement planning actually is highly associated with the financial literacy. Uh, so we try to understand financial literacy. So we use the big three questions, which for, for interest rate, inflation, and risk diversification. We also use the time value of money to understand this. And then we try to understand who is financial literate and who is not. And because of the, uh, you'll find that always males are always more financial literate than the, uh, you know, uh, the woman. And then even age, we'll find that it, the lower, uh, uh, you know, the younger age are able to give answer, better answer than the, uh, the, uh, the older people. And that is because of some policy have taken government in, in the, in the such mass education lately and that's what reflected here and uh, if you think about then we thought about how they are thinking about the planning and then we thought about who was planning and who was not planning so we divided our uh, sample into planners and non-planners and then we try to understand uh, you know their relationship so retirement planning actually you know uh, we have done that if they are unwilling to save so we have given a score of one if not then given a zero so accordingly we make four different models uh, with the uh, uh, logistic model, we have financial literacy score, the number of questions they have answered, so total score, and then if they give in all three, then one, if not, then zero. If at least 
two correct, then given one. If not, then at least one correct, then given one. So different models we have used. And ultimately we found that when the financial literacy score, when you use, it is important for uh, you know, planning to save. And you'll find the you know, males also you know, uh, say try, save more than women 11 times. And if they have access to bank, then they have a propensity to save three times more, right? And in the middle income, people actually save, try to save more. Uh, so this is also we find. And even five, the older age people actually save twice than the other. And you also find that you know, education, the school level education and higher education is, is actually you know, give them a much more uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, help to uh, at least you know, higher education help to improve the you know, save by three times. And the same thing has actually witnessed in most all the models, right? So if you think about the findings, we, what we found that you know, the, there is a positive relation with the higher financial literacy and the old age financial planning in India. And we found that access to banking has improved the probability of saving by three times. Males are more uh, likely to save. Uh, there is a higher age is actually significant associated with the financial literacy. Middle income uh, level workers are statistically significant. They try to save more 80% than the others. And school level education and uh, you know, higher education actually you know, improves the uh, you know, savings by three times, you know, 346%. Uh, so therefore we thought about from that, that, that you know, we must have a, a direct financial literacy program to improve the financial literacy of the old age securities. And in long run, to improve the overall financial education, it is crucial to introduce financial literacy at the school level as absolutely an indispensable subject because that will then improve the financial literacy of the, all the people from the childhood, as well as uh, the girls also will be able to, you know, uh, uh, able to have uh, that financial literacy at the early stage. So you know, that difference between girls and boys may be you know, reduced then. And then reduce the minimum requirement of presently the EPFO required that 20 people have to be there because in informalization, formalization I was talking about. So formal, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the organized, unorganized sector, if it's going to be formalized, then it comes under the EPFO if you employ 10, uh, 20 people uh, in, your, uh, in your organization. But if you reduce it from 20 to, at present it is 20 to 10, then we may include more and more MSME into the formal way, then formalization would be much higher, then EPFO benefit would go to the uh, workers that may help help them to improve their you know uh, the the future planning for the old age and then a creation of job important for improving a stable income which will help them to have more income and as we talk formalization of informal jobs which is more important in this case so we need to expand the general education level as we find out uh, the education is important uh, factor and improve the financial inclusion by offering even the supply side by financial products, right? So supply side here is also important as we found that bank account is substantially improved the access to the, uh, you know, there are three times more uh, if somebody is having bank account to go for any kind of financial services because they actually witness certain kind of financial services they are actually started uh, experiencing. I that mean, actually helped them. To it. Yes, uh, this is my last point uh, to say that, you know, if you introduce a customized pension system along with those you know, financial inclusion program that may help them to understand better and they may go for a better, uh, you know, they may opt for a different kind of financial uh, products for the old age security. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Abla. So the next speaker is um, Olga Fuentes from the Pension Regulatory Body of Chile. Uh, she is going to, to talk about uh, a solution to address longevity, the increase in longevity and the longevity risk, a proposal to develop a sustainable, viable lifetime retirement income solution. So let's see what is this proposal and how it can be achieved. Thank you, Olga, All the floor is yours. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, thank you also for the invitation to, to present uh, this seminar. Okay, so uh, this, is a, this is a joint work with uh, Richard Fulmer and Manuel Garcia. Uh, it's, a, it's a proposal uh, to improve the payout options uh, in the case of the Chilean pension system, but, uh, but actually it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a proposal that can be also uh, addressed uh, uh, the longevity risk challenge in a, in a, in similar pensions uh, pension systems. Um, so the 
Okay, so uh, I'm going to give a very quick overview of the of the Chilean pension system first, and what are the main uh, payout uh, uh, options uh, for the disaccumulation phase. Uh, and then, uh, so we are going to evaluate uh, the, the, the proposal, where, uh, which is a, a something like arrangement uh, with the goal to improve pension uh, payouts. Uh, some of the advantages is, uh, is transparency, um, investment flexibility. Uh, it gives you higher expected income streams when you compare this with a program withdraw. Uh, well, it has no explicit guarantees, so it's, it's, uh, it's less costly than, uh, than and, 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 and this kind of alternative. So, uh, and different proposals are analyzed. Uh, we have first uh, a simple tontine arrangement, but then uh, we design a, a, a deferred pension arrangement uh, and also a, a solutions in which we, we combine that with the uh, existing uh, payout uh, products. And finally, what are the main lesson implications and the, and the next steps? So a quick overview of the Chilean pension system. The Chilean pension system is a three pillar um, uh, scheme. Um, the, the first pillar is the solidarity pillar. The main goal is to prevent poverty. Uh, the funding are uh, fiscal general taxes, and the benefits are a basic pension for those that uh, never participate in the pension system and a top up uh, for individuals uh, with, uh, with low savings. Uh, and it's a mean tested uh, benefit that uh, you need to qualify to, to get the solidarity pillar, and it's, it's focused on the 60% uh, poorest uh, of the population. The, the second pillar is the, uh, the individual account, uh, the mandatory individual account uh, uh, defined contribution uh, scheme. Uh, the main objective is to, um, is to smart, a, a smooth consumption between the accumulation and the disaccumulation phase. Uh, the funding are uh, 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 individ the individual savings. Uh, uh, that uh, receive uh, uh, different tax exemptions. Uh, and the benefit uh, basically depend on the, uh, the self-finance pension um, uh, given your, your uh, total uh, uh, cumulative uh, savings. And then the, the third pillar is a voluntary scheme. Um, you have individual and also uh, 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 collective um, uh, plans um, and to, to, to promote the, the voluntary savings, uh, 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 the, the regulation uh, uh, offers uh, tax incentives and also there's a step uh, matching. Um, and also depends on the, on the individual total final savings. So, so when you when you um, have to uh, you have to decide uh, which type of payout product to take, uh, you have your total uh, savings account uh, coming from the second and the third pillar, uh, and then you choose uh, payout options, and and then on top of that, uh, if you qualify uh, qualify for the solidarity pillar, you get the you get the top up benefit. So, uh, so this is uh, this is the 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 payout phase products uh, and the and the contribution of each of them. Uh, this is the the this is the selection of uh, pension products uh, for new for new pensioners uh, in the in the last uh, uh, three years. Uh, so, uh, what what you have is that uh, there's a large it's a large percentage of, uh, of pensioners um, with a program with go. And, uh, and this is because of choice, uh, but also uh, to a large degree, uh, because the, 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 the program will draw is the, is the default uh, for, for pensioners with uh, low balances. So the, the pension product selection is, is allowed only for those individu individuals able to self-finance a pension above the, the basic pension. 
Uh, so uh, the, the default for those uh, with uh, self-financed pensions uh, uh, below this value is the, is the program control. Some of them uh, qualify for the solidarity pillar and the, the solidarity pillar gives them a, a longevity risk coverage, but, but in general, uh, uh, the, the, the program will draw uh, is, uh, uh, is, is very large in, temp, in terms of the, of the payout uh, phase uh, product. So you have there that the program will draw by default uh, is 73% uh, uh, for women uh, and 42% uh, for men. So a, a large percentage of, of pensioners uh, has as a payout uh, product uh, a, a program will draw. Uh, and uh, uh, well, uh, this is the same for the, for every for every system, right? So the, the challenges for the payout phase is the increased longevity, the decrease in interest rate. Uh, if you look uh, uh, in the case of Chile, uh, someone retiring in 2020 uh, received a pension uh, benefit 40 uh, percent uh, lower than the than the same person retiring in the year 2000. Uh, if we, if we compare with the international experience, actually in Chile, the annuitization rate has been historically high. Uh, this, this, has been, uh, this has been decreasing or declining in the, in the, recent, in the recent years. Uh, but given the, the design of the system, uh, the, the program will draw uh, is something that has been in the, in the discussion uh, uh, in the context of, the, of a pension reform. And, uh, and, uh, and the program will draw is, uh, is, is uh, an attractive, is, is very an attractive product uh, given the following, the following reasons, right? So uh, it gives you a high level of income early in retirement, but this level is, is completely unsustainable. It, it decreases uh, uh, very quickly at uh, advanced age, uh, ages. Uh, also, uh, you don't have any any risk pooling uh, with the with the program withdrawal. Uh, you have the risk of outliving your your savings, uh, and uh, and given that pension adequacy, adequacy is relevant not only at the time of retirement but also but also in the in the long run, uh, the retiree financial situations uh, becomes uh, much worse uh, at more advanced ages, and this is affecting. And more to women uh, as they are likely to live longer and, uh, and end life uh, uh, alone. So, uh, so having this, uh, this in mind and, and, and having that this, uh, there has been a lot of discussion about uh, how to improve uh, the payout uh, product and how to improve uh, the program we draw. Uh, we, uh, we design a, a, a proposal where uh, we have this uh, a longevity risk pooling arrangement, uh, uh, and the decision is, is uh, irreversible, uh, in which the, the members are, uh, agree to pool their savings. Uh, they receive payouts where, uh, while they're living, and, and they, they give other accounts uh, uh, upon debt to the surviving members. Uh, so you have uh, two sources of returns. You have investment income uh, and the longevity credits uh, from the balances of members who have died. Uh, also, uh, uh, using the, the Dontin design and the Dontin principle, uh, we, uh, we can design a, a payout that, uh, that is closer to, to what you want to have as a, as a pension payout. So uh, uh, in, the, in this case, um, our simulations, uh, we are doing an open-ended uh, in which uh, you continually accept new participants. And, and uh, so the, the product is running in perpetuity. And, and also you can have, uh, uh, you can design the buyouts uh, to a smooth consumption. Um, so, uh, 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 and, and again, uh, the, the, the main characteristic of a Tontin design, so you don't have explicit guarantee. Uh, you can design this as to be actually fair uh, and also to have upside potential and also to offer choice to, to members. 
in terms of the investment portfolio, uh, the payer features, uh, and also you can combine this with, uh, with, other, with other options. So this is a, a summary of the, of the, of the, method, of the methodology. Uh, and we model an account-based heterogeneous open-ended consent system. Um, uh, operate on a set of individual accounts in which investors can make their own investment decisions, accept members of different ages and genders, uh, runs in perpetuity. Uh, we use, uh, we, we calibrate the, the model using information for the Chilean pension system. So we use the Chilean mortality tables. Uh, the members, members size is 10,000 participants. Uh, each member joins uh, randomly as, as assigned parameters such as gender, age, and the account balance. Uh, the age range from 60 to 65 uh, for women and 65 to 70 for men, which is consistent with the legal retirement age for both, for both uh, genders. Um, and also uh, the account balance are determined range between 1,000 UFS to 10,000 UFS. Uh, and the, the, we didn't design a particular investment option. We just use the, the, the multi-fund multi scheme, uh, which is the one that is available for the, for the program we call. And we do 10,000 simulation runs. Uh, each run span, is spanning the 50, 50, 55 years from 2021 to 2075. So basically this is, uh, this is one of the simulations. So we have it on team compared with the, with the program we go. Um, and, uh, and, and, and you can see that the, the team um, uh, improve a lot the, the payout, the stability of payout uh, uh, as the pensioner uh, gets older. Uh, this, uh, this is uh, mainly given by the the, the survivorship, uh, uh, the survivor credit. Uh, so you see here the, the payout decomposition and, uh, and you see that uh, uh, the survivor credit represent 14% uh, of the payout at age 65 and, and rises to more than 80% uh, by age uh, 100. Uh, but also what we, we think that is very uh, interesting is uh, is the following uh, the following result in which uh, we uh, we combine a, a temporal we go uh, with a with a deferred on team and we compare that with the with the with the with the program uh, with the program we go uh, and 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 you can see that you just need a very small uh, portion allocated to the to the deferred on team, in this case, uh, close to 12%. Uh, and this can uh, uh, improve a lot uh, uh, the payout, uh, indicating the, the relevant effect of the, of the survival uh, credit. So here, the, the deferred period is, uh, is, 20, is 20 years. Uh, and uh, we did an additional exercise in which uh, we simulate uh, a deferred tontin strategy uh, and the deferral period is, 20, is 25 years. And, and uh, by making the, 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 the deferral period longer, uh, what you get is, is that uh, the, the longevity insurance uh, provided by the deferred tontin uh, become uh, less expensive that you just need a 40% of, uh, of the balance uh, uh, to, ha to have this, uh, this, uh, this payout uh, uh, profile. And, and of course, if you compare that with the, with the program we'll draw, uh, you can see that, uh, that, uh, that the, 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 the tontine, the referred tontine with the temporal we draw is, uh, is a superior, uh, is a superior uh, uh, option uh, for the, for the pension. Uh, and also uh, something that is also uh, important uh, in, the, in the Chilean context uh, is uh, that uh, uh, in general affiliates and pensioners uh, value a lot uh, uh, the ability to leave asset uh, as a bequest. So having this combination of, uh, of product uh, 
allow uh, allow two things. Uh, one, uh, uh, protect uh, your your, pens your pension from uh, from falling um, later in life with what is happening with the program we go, but also retain some ability to leave a to to leave asset as a uh, as a bequest and uh, and and actually. Uh, uh, you can you can uh, combine uh, different percentage of allocation to the to the tontine or to the deferred tontine uh, to have this uh, to have this uh, this, uh, this trail. So um, uh, so what what is what are the main the main uh, uh, implications uh, of this? So there's a bit a lot of discussion uh, about how to protect. Uh, uh, pensioners uh, from longevity risk and in, in the Chilean context, um, uh, and I we, uh, we believe that this proposal uh, uh, is a very relevant uh, input in that in that discussion. Uh, in general, there's a, there's a need for for pension system, uh, not only in Chile, to, to improve uh, the, the stability and the and the sustainability of pension uh, payments. Um, and, uh, and we believe that the, the solution should be limited to increasing the take up of, of annuities. Um, uh, we, we compare this um, uh, income stream of, of uh, various tontine designs with the, with the payout uh, offer uh, or ex the existing payout in the, in the, in the Chilean pension system. And, and the, the key result are the, uh, if you compare with the, with the program where we go, uh, our proposal uh, increased the income levels in a, in a very significant way, uh, 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 even, even uh, having a very small allocation to, to the, to the tontine in the case of the, of the deferred uh, tontine strategy. And also that this solution can be, uh, can be combined with the, with the existing option to, to tailor a, uh, Particular uh, preferences for income streams and uh, and also to satisfy uh, the bequest uh, goals. Uh, also, uh, our proposal offers a way to make a, to make a market for pension uh, solutions uh, that uh, uh, insurance companies might not be willing to offer. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, defer defer products. Uh, and also uh, in terms of uh, policy design, um, a Tontin solution also will allow for have a national longevity risk. Uh, you can all uh, have the pools at the, at the uh, uh, pension fund administrator levels, uh, uh, but this is just a, a decision uh, of design that you, that you have to make. And then, um, uh, what we see as the main areas of innovation, well, to, to have a, an investment strategy for, for the Tontine in, in, uh, in this paper, we just use the, the multi-fund scheme already in the, in the, in the regulation. Uh, you can also allow for different level of heterogeneity. One of them is the life expectancy differences among socioeconomic groups. Uh, and also, uh, Something that has been also in the discussion is how to incorporate this uh, uh, collective uh, features into a DC into the C scheme, and, uh, and 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 we believe that uh, in, in a tontin like arrangement uh, is uh, is uh, straightforward to 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 incorporate to the to the design this uh, this other these other features. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Olga. Thank you very much, the three speakers. Uh, it has been quite interesting to hear uh, three, not unrelated because it's all about improving uh, retirement outcomes, uh, ideas, the multiple accounts, how to make uh, informal workers to participate and how to organize the, the payout phase in a way that um, people get better retirement outcomes that are currently have in, in some countries like in Chile. So thank you very much. And I pass on the baton to, to Hazel and to Bas that will be in charge of the second part of the meeting. Thank you. So my name is uh, Bas Werker. I'm uh, going to chair the second part of this uh, uh, session. I'm uh, affiliated to uh, Tilburg uh, University and, uh, and NETSPAR. 
So without uh, much uh, further comments, uh, let's get started with the uh, content. So our first presentation will be by uh, Javier uh, Oliveira from the uh, Luxembourg Institute of Socioeconomic Research and the Catholic University of uh, Peru. Um, and actually, Javier is uh, from a, relative to his PhD, uh, very nearby uh, from my perspective. He got his PhD from uh, KU uh, uh, Leuven, which is only uh, a few kilometers away. And he will be uh, talking about the uh, gender gap in pension savings evidence from Peru. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks to the organizers for accepting my, my uh, research. Uh, I am uh, in Peru right now in Lima, so I am very happy to present uh, this, uh, this paper. Um, the idea here is that uh, we, uh, in Peru, we have a, a individual pension, uh, individual capitalization pension system. Uh, we call this a RAA system. So in Spanish, it's a SPP or private pension system. And this is the main system in Peru. So we have also a pub, uh, public pension system, but most of the people, they go to the private pension system. And then we were wondering uh, with my co-author, if uh, what is uh, the gender gap here? Because uh, we there are some studies uh, looking at the gender gap in pensions in the benefit, but not many uh, studies looking at the pension gap uh, in pension savings. I mean, in the pension balance. And then we thought, okay, let, let's try to see uh, how is that the case uh, in Peru. Uh, and another issue is that in Peru uh, now, uh, when people get 65, when they get retirement age. They don't. Uh, they are not obliged to buy an annuity anymore, so they can cash the money, ninety-five point five percent, and do whatever they want. So this is why it's very relevant to study uh, how the gender gap in pension savings, and not so much on the on the, on the pension itself, because this system is not generating uh, too many pensions. No, indeed, few people just go and buy an annuity, and most of them they just uh, cash the money. And really, we don't know what, what, what they do with it. No? So uh, this, these systems, uh, the individual capitalization uh, systems, are very popular in Latin America, uh, not so much in, in, other, in other countries. Uh, uh, let me see, there is a, OK, perdón. Uh, sorry, uh, OK. Uh, it's very popular in Latin America, but no, not so much in, in other countries. And there has been many critiques against this system because of distributional uh, concerns, tend to favor the better of individuals or also the pension fund managers, and also have high administrative costs, and also they uh, tend to offer very low pensions. And this was one of the main problems in Chile, for example. Uh, this is why there has been many protests there. But at the same time, there are some positive effects as well. Now, there are positive effects more or less at the macro level, like they have contributed uh, to increase national savings, economic growth, and to develop the annuity market. So uh, in the balance, really, uh, it's, it's very complicated, very complex to say if we agree or not with this system. But what we agree is that some changes has, has to be made no, to make the system work much better. <clears throat> these systems are compulsory in countries like Peru, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, El Salvador, Mexico, and Dominican Republic but also are part of mixed existence in other countries like Costa Rica, Panama, Uruguay. Uh, importantly, this system will reproduce and will expand labor income inequalities through the capitalization process and the density of contributions. I mean, the frequency of making contributions to the pension system. These ideas are somehow more similar to financial wealth because it's a contribution that is earning uh, a return rate and also people face uh, some financial risk for this investment. Uh, by contrary, la, the defend, uh, DBE schemes, uh, defined benefit schemes, they tend to reduce pension gap through different pension rules like minimum benefits, maximum pensions, or unisex life tenure. Also, there are some contribu non contributory pension programs. In Peru, it's called uh, Pension 65, and they treat equally men and women. So, and these transfers, they kind of uh, favor, uh, the, they reduce the gender gap in pensions uh, between women and, and men. Uh, but in Peru, this uh, IRA system uh, has, uh, is, does not include pension, uh, minimum pension, does not include other benefits. And also the affiliates of this pension system are not eligible to take 
non-contributory pensions because these non-contributory pensions are mostly for people who live in extreme poverty and don't have any other pension. So in the end, uh, is in Peru, having this pension system is equivalent to have a, pen, a financial wealth, and that's it. No, it's, it's very far from what we know about social security. Uh, however, there are two forces we notice. Uh, the first one is that uh, income gaps uh, are reducing across cohorts. So we see that among younger cohorts, wage differences are, are not so much as were before. But at the same time, the capitalization process through the return rate and the period you capitalize can magnify income gaps uh, across here. No? Pension funds in Peru are also large, so I think it's worth to study uh, how they are impacting the, the gender gap in pension savings. Uh, here I just show some very uh, easy uh, stylized uh, uh, relationships about the, 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 the gender gap in pension savings. No? Recall that in Peru, people can catch the money uh, a retirement age at 95.5%, uh, they can get almost all the funds and do whatever they want. This is why I think it's more interesting, more relevant to study uh, gender gaps in, in, in patient savings. No? Patient savings is defined by this B, so it's just equal uh, to the capitalization, the consumption rate multiplied by the salary, multiplied by the density. This means the uh, expected contribution times the return rate across a period I just put from 25 to 65. And then if we just uh, combine the, the pension balance of a male and a female, then we get this relationship. And then you can see clearly that there is a component uh, coming from the labor market, the differences in salary and the differences in the density and the contribution density, and also another part coming from the capital market. No? Uh, in this case, uh, is through the return rate and also through the period uh, the people is capitalized. Of course, we can also add other things like risk, for example. But then the, the main components, it will be a labor market component, a capital market component to explain this gender gap. Some uh, statistics about uh, Peru. Uh, in the market, uh, uh, the gender gap is about uh, 27%, so this means uh, the average of uh, income of females is 73% of men. And we notice that this uh, gap has been reducing across time. And that is good, good news. But also we notice that there's also uh, gender gaps in the participation in the pension system in Peru. In Peru it's, not compulsory, it's compulsory to be in a pension system only if you are in the formal market. If you are not in the formal market, you are not obliged to contribute, to enroll to any system. And then we see that male uh, has more participation than female also in the, in the pension system. When we look at a public pension system, where the is a you go system, when there are minimum, maximum pensions, we notice that uh, the pensions between men and women are more similar. The, the pension gap is small, it's just 15%. But then when we look at the balance in the private pension system, we notice that the, the, the gender gap is large, it's, it's about 27%. It's quite similar to the uh, gender gap in income. But this is just average. We need to look at how is the gender gap across different parts of the distribution of, of pension balance. What is the data we are going to use? Um, uh, it has been fortunate that it has been uh, granted access to administrative registers of the, of the private pension system. So this means I have uh, different uh, for different years, I have different samples uh, for uh, many uh, affiliates of many individuals. Now, these samples are random, are stratified, and representative for by sex, year of enrollment, and for uh, group uh, age group as well. Uh, this is interesting because in Peru uh, we don't have, uh, like in Chile, for example, a, a good uh, survey taking information of the pension system. We, we, we really don't have, and then we have to rely in uh, administrative records to, uh, to study uh, some interesting topics on in pension economics. In this case, uh, there are not many available uh, variables, but importantly, we have uh, the pension balance of each person, we have uh, the, administrator, uh, the, the pension fund administrator, also the kind of fee the person is paying, uh, and so on. The sample is 2%. 
of, uh, of non total non-retired population for each year. In total, we started with a sample of 600,000 individuals, but then uh, about 12% of observations has uh, zero pension balance. So we dropped these people because uh, for many cases, these people were enrolled long time ago, but they didn't have any, any positive pension balance. So there was this kind of phantom, or, or phantom uh, affiliates that they never contribute or they were never aware of being contributing. So we, we dropped it. And then in the end, we have a final sample of 533,000 individuals. Here is the composition here. And our analysis will be focused on, <clears throat> on the pool sample or sometimes on just the last year, on 2019. So here uh, are just some quick uh, statistics. Then you will notice that the differences uh, between women and men are significant across all the, the variables that we have considered. Across cohorts, you notice that the, the older the cohort, the larger the pension, the pension balance gap. Also, uh, uh, the, the more time you are affiliated, also the longer the pension, uh, the, the, balance, the pension balance gap. So this is normal because uh, the more time you are uh, capitalizing, so your wealth is increasing and then the differences are going to expand. Also in the last panel, you will see that the, the gender gap is very large in the top 1% of the pension balance distribution. So it's really, really large. And then you will see across a different uh, uh, percentiles that this uh, gender gap is increasing. So it's not only important only to see at the average, also it's important to see how this gender gap is moving across the distribution of pension wealth. Uh, this graph, uh, I like this graph a lot. Uh, the, this is uh, the share of women uh, who are uh, in the unconditional distribution of pension balance. No? The red line uh, is the percentage of women in total in the, in, the, in the pension system. In 2005, it's about 35%. But then if you decompose this, if you plot this uh, along the percentiles of the pension fund, you will see that more or less uh, the, the women are, are participating equally across different uh, quantiles, but they start to, to grow up in the quantile 70, 80, but then it starts to go down in the 90 and also in the top quantiles. But this situation is changing in 2013, 2016, and 2019. So it's, it's going a bit downwards and with a more clear negative slope. And then in 2019, you will see the participation of women is very high in the poorer percentiles and is very low in the, in the top percentile. So here you really notice the, uh, the position of women is deteriorating across the year and also across different quantiles. No? Here, uh, I just want to show uh, how is the gender gap uh, across uh, the number of years you're affiliated in the, in the pension system. And as, as I showed before, it's increasing on the number of years. So it's much larger, and this is part of the capitalization process. Here is just, uh, I just show a simple wireless regression of the pension balance against this uh, coverage. And then we notice that. Uh, the significant association of being male uh, holds uh, in all the models that we are going to do. So it's always uh, important, uh, it's important variable to explain uh, differences in, pay, in pension value. Here, uh, this is some of bad news, uh, this uh, graph, because this is the, the, gender, uh, the, the gender gap across uh, their cohorts and also in two different years. So the first new uh, is good because you will see that the, pen, the gender gap is increasing across cohorts, it's negative. But the bad news is the gender gap is increasing across periods. So from 2005 to 2019, the gender gap increased. So there are these, these two, two forces, no? But in the end, we are going to see the, the period is going to be more important, is going to cancel out the good news of the of the wage uh, of, of the gender gap in, in wage that is reducing across the cohorts. Now I move to the to the regression to the regression regression part. Uh, we are going to apply unconditional quantization, so we are going to use the RIF, the methodology of RIF. So this is a recent influence function. The idea of this is that we we find what is the influence function 
of each observation, explaining the level, uh, explaining a statistic. In this case, we're going to use a quantile, but this statistic could be the Gini coefficient, could be the Atkinson or any other. And the idea is that when we linearize this, we can find the effect of a, a small movement in a covariate, how it's going to affect uh, the statistic of interest, in this case, our quantile. And then the important thing is that the distribution of the other covariates is holding constant. And that is the main difference when we apply conditional quantile regression. So this is just a, a simple formula. Uh, we, I'm going to use the same covariates that I showed before in the wireless regression. And this, those are the results. The first column shows the OLS. So we just lose, if we just look at the OLS, we will see that about uh, being male explain more or less 17% uh, of the differences in pension balance. But then if we uh, go along the different quantiles, we're going to see first a decline and then also uh, an uh, increase in the explanation of being made on the differences on uh, the pension balance. It's better if I show you the graph, the following slide. Here, I just plot the estimates of the unconditional effects on quantiles of the pension balance distribution for males. So the, the, the variable I showed you before, I just plot here. And the first thing that we have to notice is that uh, it's always positive. So in all the quantiles, uh, the effect of being male is positive. So it's increasing, it's replacing the distribution of pension balance to the right. So being male uh, contributes to increase uh, the amount uh, of a pension balance in, in this distribution. That is the first, the first thing to notice. The second thing to notice is kind of more positive because we will see the, uh, uh, the role or the strength of being male is decreasing across the quantiles. That's good news because this means that the role of being woman is increasing in relative strength. But this is only until the quantile 80, 85 model there. So this means that the women are kind of uh, facing a, a sailing class until 85. And after that, again, the importance of being male start to increase in the top quantiles. No? And, the, and, and the women are not uh, performing well in the last quantile. So th this is really interesting because this means that uh, the, the power of uh, of this uh, decreasing on the wage differences across cohorts has a limit. And after this limit, uh, the, there is this, uh, this uh, effect of being male uh, that is dominating the effect of the re 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 reducing gaps in, in, in wages. This is something interesting because we wanted to know if what explained these, the differences, uh, these differences on gender gap. And we thought that maybe one of them is financial literacy. We don't have too many variables really to, to explore in our data, but we have a regulation in Peru. When you turn 60 years old, uh, you are moved by default to the pension fund one. So this means a low risk fund. Only if you say in advance, I don't want to move there, I want to be number two, uh, that is a, a moderate uh, risk pension fund, then you are not moved. So only we assume that only uh, people who is aware about risk, also aware of these financial decisions are going to to move out of the default. And then we call this variable uh, uh, risk uh, awareness about, about risk diversification or financial literacy. And then we're going to, to see having this uh, risk awareness being financial literate, interacted by male, has a big effect on the, on the, on the higher uh, quantile. So this means that financial literacy has a role. And when we interact by male, we, we see that it contributes even more uh, to the differences on pension balance and growth of women and men. No? Of course, it would be nicer to explore this more with better data, but this is the data we have. Uh, but at least we notice that this regulation in Peru is not working well because it's provoking that people is not getting uh, enough returns for, for their pension savings. No? Perhaps we should uh, rethink uh, this default pension risk. Just to conclude, uh, we observe that in Peru, there is a large gender gap in pension savings in the private pension system. Even the gender wage gap reduced across cohorts, that is good news, but the capitalization process of this IRA system and the lack of minimum benefits may reverse this improvement. Low financial literacy captured by our risk awareness variable also contributes to expand the gender gap across the distribution of pension funds. 
I really think we have to think about this default in Peru, no, uh, no, not to uh, affect negatively the pension savings of people who don't see. Um, and that's so, uh, so a lot. Okay. Thank you, uh, Javier. That will be uh, given by uh, Brad Hammond from uh, Capital uh, Group, where he is a research leader. Uh, Brad holds his, holds his PhD from uh, the uh, MIT and is going to tell us how you can, uh, let the map uh, life cycle uh, uh, financial uh, theory into uh, an applied uh, setting with uh, when actually designing target date funds. Thank you. And thank you to Silk and, uh, and Hazel and everyone else. Um, very interesting stuff. Anyway, so this this is by a group of us at Capital at Capital Group in uh, in Los Angeles, and we are all researchers, but and we are all familiar with life cycle models, and we've built one. But we're but we're not going to talk. As Boss says, we're not going to tell you today about the the details of the model, although there's an appendix and you know with all that. Um, what we're going to do is talk about practical issues, and what I mean by that is that we, there's a lot of life cycle models out there and some very good ones. Um, and there's a lot of what in the United States are called target date funds. And in fact, we're seeing target date funds in other countries with defined contribution uh, arrangements. And what, what happens when you bring the two of them together? And how should you bring the two of them together is really what this is about. So the point is, what do we learn? Um, what can we learn from, from developing a life cycle model for actual use? The, so a real world target date fund, uh, the design questions are, you know, there are, there are a, a range of design questions and they sh and our point is that they should, those questions should guide a life cycle model development. They shouldn't be done, the, the two shouldn't be done in isolation. The, the second point is that a life cycle model can indeed inform the target date design process, not all of it because of some of the limitations of target date funds, but some important parts like glide paths. Uh, overall glide paths and so forth. And then and our, 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 our real point is that solving for those two things, the, the life cycle model and, and target date design, involve a feedback loop where one informs the other. So you can improve one by, by thinking about the other at the same time. Okay, so, what do, so let's motivate this a little more. Uh, you can see the growth of target date funds in, uh, um, in, the, in the US. It's just taken off. And there have been public policy reasons for that, and and plan reasons for that, but uh, which we can go, which we won't go into. But there, there's just been a huge growth since the first one was introduced in the 1990s. The the other thing is, of course, life cycle models, and life cycle models have have improved a lot um, uh, since uh, since Franco Bendigliani, who you can see there, uh, first started thinking about lifetime consumption issues, and he, um, and the, the, the models typically employ dynamic programming. Uh, they're, they're computationally intensive so that you end up with uh, fewer than, you know, significantly fewer than 10 uh, state variables to, uh, uh, because of some of the limitations of computation. Uh, and they've mostly been used in hypothetical or, or academic research settings. Not always, because there are, there are firms out there that are using life cycle models. But a lot of the development has really come from uh, academic research, such as uh, Raymond Maurer at the, and, and others, but certainly Raymond Maurer at the University of Frankfurt has been a, a leader in this, as, as well as some others. So what do we do at, the, at uh, Capital Group? Well, we started a life cycle fund um, in, in 2007, and we didn't use a lot, uh, sorry, we, a target date fund, let me be precise, and we didn't use a life cycle model to, to do it. Uh, we use a, a range of analytical tools, but not a life cycle model at that point. And our, our, uh, our uh, American funds um, target date funds have been quite successful. We call them American funds target date. Uh, they've been quite successful over time. Assets have grown. Um, and we, in, a, in essence, we didn't, we sort of didn't understand that they, you know, the success that they'd be, and and we're not alone. I mean, the Fidelity, Vanguard, uh, BlackRock, whole range of companies have very successful life cycle funds. What happens though is in in the last couple of years we've um, we've undergone a uh, major change in in the kinds of resources and the amount of resources that we're devoting to design and, and development of our and management of our life cycle, our target date funds. And one of the, so what we've done is come up with a, a system for doing this. It's both process oriented and tool oriented. And they, we combine 
um, those those things. One of the big steps is the strategic asset allocation. You can see the you know what we think of as 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 a set of steps that all involve feedback. And the the key here is the one in the middle, the glide path uh, that that the, that we're focusing our lifecycle model development on. Uh, so, uh, but and so it's not necessarily going to inform some of the other things, although we're trying to make it do that in the future. Within strategic asset allocation, which is the equity fixed income balance over a glide path, so I won't explain glide paths, but I think you know what they are. Uh, over the glide path, what should be the equity fixed income allocation? And that's question number one. And the question number two is how much flexibility should we be allowing that? Uh, there are both passively managed and actively managed uh, target date funds, and ours is actively managed. And that means that they, the funds within the, the target date fund are actively managed, but we also dynamically manage the allocations between equity and fixed income, between international and, and domestic equity, et cetera, et cetera. So the lifecycle model can help us inform uh, both the, the glide path itself and the flexibility around it. So that's, and we use not just a lifecycle model, but we use other methods to do that too. So here's what we, here's, here's a, sort of what our current uh, asset class uh, equity fixed income glide path looks like from a just age 45 to uh, uh, to plus 30 years, so age 95, and um, oh sorry, 45 years before retirement, 30 years after, but it's basically 25 to 95. And then you see in the gray, the gray bar is the flexibility band that we've historically used. So we'll we'll allow the equity fixed income uh, consciously to vary uh, within that band. The current glide path is what you see in the green. So you can see it's, it's uh, higher in equity than the, than the average has been over, over a period of time. You can also see in the other places, some of our other analyses of geographic flexibility, uh, equ uh, equity growth of the style, market cap, um, and, and, uh, and so forth. So we do other things, but this, the upper left is where our lifecycle model is currently focused. So, what we, as I said, what we did is we undertook a, a, a multi-asset, all of our multi-asset products of the, in the last couple of years, we undertook a major review of those, including adding resources and developing new tools, one of which was a lifecycle model. And what we, but we, we wanted to do that in combination with some other things. So we wanted to develop more than one analytical framework to replicate, to see if we could replicate our glide path. But if we couldn't replicate the glide path, then it would call into question uh, what, you know, what, whether that glide path was appropriate. And we also wanted to see what the flexibility ranges were. Um, and one of the key things we did was, was that our life cycle model was developed without trying to, without attempting to rec replicate. In other words, we didn't keep tweaking it until we got the current glide path. We, we sent people away in a room and said, you know, uh, develop this and let's see what happens when you pull it out. Now, what's going to be similar is that some of the assumptions that are being used are going to be similar to the assumptions we used in the first place, but we still kept, kept things a bit separate. So we wanted to iterate, test, learn, and not necessarily change, but, but, uh, but improve if, if needed. And we wanted to use the lifecycle models results to inform our, our glide path design, not determine it. Okay. So that's, that's really, uh, really important. Okay. So we, we use equities and fixed income. We, uh, we, you know, there were some investment issues we had to figure out. How do we characterize investment returns, you know, with, with cap, you know, using capital market assumptions and with, uh, you know, we, we had to figure out what we thought volatilities, covariances, skews, et cetera. And we did make some, uh, make some assumptions about that. Uh, we also wanted to pay, pay attention to investor behavior because investor behavior, you know, how, what are the contributions rates? What is income? How does income grow? What is wealth accumulation? What are labor patterns such as that affect contribution rates and wealth accumulation such as interruptions? And that became very important both before retirement and after where you might have some spending shocks. Um, and so we wanted to take those things into account in our model. So we, so we built a life cycle model, and I'm not going to give you all the details because the, 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 the generally life cycle models are fairly well known, you know, dynamic programming is the basis and then the, then uh, a range of other methods that go into it what i what i will do is say is give you an example here of what we did that shows the interaction between the questions we're asking in the in our target about our target date fund design and the life cycle model that 
um, that we were developing, and that and that is uh, the, the multi-grid modeling methodology. So multi-grid is this is an example of an issue that makes a difference, uh, and it you know and it, and it involves highly technical research, but also practical questions. So in in uh, the problem is in the academic world where solution time isn't critical, lifecycle model calculations in, with, with with even six state variables can take a huge amount of time. So we we didn't have that time, right? We couldn't iterate. We couldn't iterate on a multi-day. Uh, um, uh, uh, calendar. So multi-grid algorithms help accelerate convergence because they can treat arbitrary region, regional boundaries uh, conditions by using a combination of fine and coarse grids. So in other words, if you have a local maximum that, you, that doesn't work, this helps you with, with it, that throws you off and this helps with that. So the multi-grid mo modeling methodology. But the problem that we found was that we, when we reduced the density of the grid, so we had both an alpha, an alpha consumption grid, and a, a wealth and um, and labor income grid. So we have two grids. And but the problem is when we reduce the density of both these labor these grids, it caused the results to curl up at the ends and become uh, uh, in, you know intuitively uh, un, you know un, unacceptable. Right? It just created uh, crazy solutions at the edges. So, and, the, and of course, increasing the overall grid density would increase the runtime, right? So, so decreasing the grid density screws up the results, increasing the, run to, uh, the density increases the runtime. What we ended up doing, I mean, and it took us a while to get there, uh, and I didn't do this, I, my co-authors figured this out. They increased the density of the, of the, uh, the grids at the edges, but not in the middle. Because in the middle we were getting decent, you know, uh, uh, decent what we thought were decent results, and by increasing at the edges, it, it increased runtime, but not unacceptably. So this was something where if we had been sort of purely uh, academic, we wouldn't have needed to do that necessarily. But in this case, we uh, we had time, we had some time dimensions that that caused us to want to uh, iterate more quickly. So what ends up what ends up happening? Well, after we did all this, some of the interim checks that we did include the following, uh, where we see uh, we we did a check saying, you know, what what is the volatility across the glide path look like in our from our model? In the upper right, what does the average wealth look like? So so we started seeing some results that seemed to make sense to us, and then what is the wealth band doing? You know, sort of the uh, the 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 wealth band range. How does that increase and decrease over? Over somebody's lifetime, and you can see that makes some sense. Where you're going to see higher uh, wealth um, uh, variations in around the age of retirement, and so ultimately, what were the results? And here, I'll give you a couple slides on our ultimate results. What you see is our current, um, uh, what we call AFTD, American Funds Target Date Funds Glide Path, in the greenish, and the the life cycle model glide path in the, in the bluish. And they're 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 closely aligned, and and that was remarkable because we didn't uh, we didn't iter we didn't um, trick the, the life cycle model into replicating the uh, the the current glide path. This was you know sending people off in a different room, and we see some differences at the beginning at the end, but not something that we that we were too concerned about. And in the middle, which is really critical because that's where the, you're changing the equity allocation the quickest. Over time, uh, we we got some we, you know we got some nearly identical results, so we were quite happy about that one. We also looked at the flexibility ranges, and the gray is what is, is the 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 uh, dotted lines are what we've uh, traditionally used as our flex range. Um, so it's narrower than the gray, which is what the life cycle model implies by uh, flexibility ranges. And the flexibility ranges you can see are quite are much higher in the later path than in the earlier path. Um, and so what we what we said is, oh, that's interesting. And we started looking into why this was this was the case. And the lifecycle model optimization is suggesting that that uh, the flexibility ranges could be uh, wider. So what did um, so what did we uh, uh, what else did we do? Well, we also did some sensitivity because we were kind of looking into this. And so what we did was we varied volatility by 100, a plus and minus 100 basis points based on what we saw as the historical variation in volatility. And here's what you get, um, the, 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 a pattern that looks uh, where, where you see a, a difference in the, in, in the life cycle, uh, sorry, in the, um, in the glide path, but not a fundamental uh, uh, change. 
Similarly, we did the same thing with, with uh, the equity risk premium. And we see in the beginning, when you have very high equities, you, you're getting some, very, some variations. When you vary the uh, equity risk premium, you get a variation in the glide path, but it collapses a bit as you get uh, further on and with lower equity all allocations. We also did two additional tests, which I won't go into, which are uh, goal, a, a goal-based approach of looking at the life cycle, uh, looking at the, the glide path, and what we call an active flex approach. So in other words, the point is that we're not just using one method to try and analyze things. So what ended up happening? Well, what ended up happening is that we changed some of our decisions modestly, but not, uh, not dramatically. And we did so because we brought together both quantitative tools, all three of our quantitative tools uh, suggested that we could increase our flex ranges, but that the basic glide path was, was, uh, was something that we could be uh, fairly co confident in. And then we used experience judgment based on the, the, uh, the many years experience that we've had running multi-asset products and, and running a target date fund, uh, that we, did, we take those things very seriously, that experience judgment. So we've retained the current strategic glide path. We widened the flex flexibility ranges, but not as by as much as the life cycle model would have suggested because we thought in our experience suggested that it would become it might become unmanageable to allow such wide flexibility ranges. And, and the model couldn't tell us that, right? It was optimizing, not telling us how we manage things. And, and we also increased the range flex asymmetry. So we had a higher band on the bottom, a bigger band on the bottom. So when markets drop, we're allowing for more flexibility in, in downtimes. So that was basically the idea. And our conclusions for this, for, for our you know, sort of self-examination of all this is that real world design questions can and should guide uh, life cycle model design. And you can see, I gave you an example of the grid stuff, but there are a number of other examples like that too. Thinking about the inputs, uh, output types, you know, your choice of how you, what, what features you want to model, what you want to be an input, what you want to be an output, those things should all be guided by uh, the practical issues. And we also can see that the lifecycle model was an important element in, in, in forming the, the target date design process. I, we showed you that. And we, we really believe that solving for the lifecycle model development and for target date design does involve a feedback loop where we, where we uh, what we learn from one helps us improve the other. And in fact, we're going forward with, uh, with uh, in the future with, try, with trying to increase our ability to look at other issues like sub-asset class allocations, uh, geographic allocations, uh, size allocations. And this is gonna be, this is gonna be tough because the, the computational issues are gonna be challenging here. So I'm gonna quit here and, uh, and say thank you so much for, for listening. And uh, I see several of, of, of the colleagues around the world that I know and I really appreciate your being here today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brett, for a very uh, nice uh, presentation. I think uh, this uh, brings us to the end of this uh, session. Uh, so thanks to uh, Javier, Anita, and, uh, and Brett. And I would then like to give the floor to our uh, IPA president, uh, Hazel Bateman, for some uh, concluding remarks. Okay, thank you very much, Buzz. And thank you, everyone. Okay, so... Um... What we've just had uh, are two sessions, which are actually the final sessions of a conference we've been holding in Australia for the last two days, well, Wednesday and Thursday. And these are two sessions hosted by IPRA, the International Pension Research Association. And when selecting papers for these sessions, what we wanted to do was to have global reach. And I think we've done that. Uh, we've had a paper from Is papers from Israel, India, Chile, Peru, and I guess uh, Midwest US and East Coast US. So we've tried to span the world. Um, I hope we've all learned something. With you know, it's, it's been very interesting to to look at issues in many different systems, and I think we've all learned something. So I'd like to thank all of our speakers for participating tonight. And I say tonight; it's tonight for me. It's early morning in other parts of the world. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Baz and Pablo for um, excellent chairing of sessions. And of course, I'd like to thank Silke for doing such excellent event management. Um, we, as I said, we've had two long days of online conference in Sydney on, on Wednesday and Thursday. And so um, it's been a bit of a tough gig to turn up at 10 o'clock on Friday night and, and do it all again. But uh, Silke's done a terrific job. 
So as far as IPRA goes, this is the last event we have for 2021. And uh, we started holding events in conjunction with the, with the pandemic. And so over the last 12 months, we've had um, quite a lot of online events. And it's been terrific to so, see so many people around the world online at different times of the day and have so much engagement. We've got um, an event calendar starting for next year. And the first event we have is an online webinar in February in conjunction with the Journal of Pension Economics and Finance. So that'll be our first event. And of course, we'll have our conference, hopefully face-to-face -face in Paris in June. So um, finally, what I want to do is to encourage you to join IPRA. It's just um, put in IPRA, ssn.org, and you'll find out more about us and also how to join. So I'd like to thank everyone for participating and I really hope to see you at our next event next year. So thank you very much, everybody.